Hey guys, this is Toby Mathis, and today we're going to talk about 12 tax deductions for small businesses. So let's jump right on in. Number one, whenever we're talking about a small business, understand that there's different varieties of how they can be set up for tax purposes. The lazy man and the easiest one is being a sole proprietor, which is really no different than you and your business being like this, one and the same. Uh, the audit rates are about six, seven, eight hundred percent higher for sole proprietors because of this, and they lose about ninety-four to ninety-five percent of their audits, and they pay more tax. So I'm just going to throw that one right out the door. If you are going into small business and you're going to do it in earnest and you're going to intend to make money, then we need to be smarter than that. We need to be an S corp, a C corp, or an LLC taxed as an S corp, or an LLC taxed as a C corp. From a tax standpoint. There's really only two flavors that I just mentioned. Even though I just mentioned four different types of structures, realistically, there's only two types of tax structures in that, an S-corp or a C-corp. C-corp, easy way to understand this, C-corps pay their own tax. It's a flat corporate tax. S-corps, the profits and the losses flow down to the individuals. That's it. That's all you really have to know. <laughs> so S-corps, Profits and everything flow onto your return. C Corp pays its own tax. Now, there is a huge difference between those two on one area where you get a deduction. One gets a huge benefit and one gets almost none. We're not going to talk about that yet. We're going to talk about the 12 big, massive, huge tax deductions that you get as a result of going into business and being smart about it and being an S or a C Corp. Now, you might have noticed that I did not mention a partnership because a partnership is the same thing as a sole proprietor. It's just more than one person. So if you are a sole proprietor and you are in a separate property state with your spouse, you are a partnership. If you are a married couple in a community property state, you are a sole proprietor. If you get together with anybody other than a spouse, you have a business partner, you are a partnership and the same rules really apply to you for the sole proprietorship. So I tend to look at those and go, no, if you're serious about your business, you're going to want to get the most out of it. You're going to want to keep as much money in your pocket as humanly possible. You're going to want to push your audit rate way low, and you're going to want all the tax incentives that they give you. And these are the big tax incentives. So number one, everything I'm talking about here, the vast majority of them is going to fall under something called an accountable plan, where the company can reimburse you. There's a couple that do not, the, the last two, which is really, I'll, I'll be hitting on those in a little bit. But the first 10 all really fall underneath this big thing called an accountable plan. An accountable plan is a really fancy way of saying a company is separate from its owners. It can reimburse its owners for any expense that owner incurs for the business. So if you are a, let's just say that I'm a shareholder because it's an S corp or a C corp or I'm a member, but for tax purposes, I'm considered to be one of the owners and I'm an employee. I qualify underneath an accountable plan to be reimbursed for anything I incur on behalf of that business. So let's talk about the things that I might incur. How about a cell phone? How about paying for the cell phone and the, and the service and the data and things like that? How about paying for internet and things like that? How about paying for a house where the business is using a room in that house? Even if it has a separate business, uh, you could still have an, a, a, an administrative office in your home if you are one of the owners and that's where you're doing your administrative services. How about, hey, I need to drive. The company doesn't own a car. It could reimburse you because you're the shareholder or you're an employee, excuse me, and I'm reimbursing you under an accountable plan. Now, why is this so magic? Because under the code, under the regs specifically, this is a ordinary necessary business expense that can be reimbursed to an employee that employee does not have to recognize that income that it just received, this reimbursement. It does not have to recognize it for federal income tax purposes or employment tax purposes. The states follow along as well. So you can literally be paying somebody back 100% of what they are incurring for their, let's just say an example is a cell phone expense. I bought a phone. Mm use it, mm, dun, 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 and I have to pay data. If the company is getting a benefit out of it, it can reimburse you for the entire cost of that. There's actually court cases 
where employees were not getting reimbursed 100% uh, of what data would cost. And the court said, no, 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 no. Just because you have an employee uh, who has a, a cell phone does not mean you as the employer could take advantage of that for free. In other words, I have to reimburse you at least what it would cost to get a basic phone or basic data. It has nothing to do with how many minutes I spent on business calls. If it's for the convenience of the employer, the employer can reimburse you. I'll use an example. Let's say you worked for ABC in Inc. And they said, you know what? You can work from home. We're going to provide you a computer. We're going to reimburse you a portion of your house. We're going to provide you a phone. We're going to provide you with data. We're going to even provide you with an, an internet line. You would say, that's awesome. No problem. Right? And the IRS would say, that's no problem. Now, let's put it a different way. Your company says, I'm going to have you work from home, but I don't really have a bunch of computers. I don't have a data plan. I don't have anything special worked out with Verizon or AT&T or Cox or any of these services. I don't have, uh, I'm not going to put a line in your house. How about this? Instead of me doing it, how about you, if you have those things or you want to go out and incur them, I will reimburse you for that. Can you do that? Absolutely under an accountable plan. So I can reimburse you for your cell phone. I can reimburse you for the data that you use in the minutes and things like that. I can reimburse you if you have to have a high-speed line in your home in order to do Zoom calls and things like that. Like, hey, I need you to be able to do video conferencing. I could reimburse you for that as an employer. I could reimburse you for your computer. Hey, go out and buy a really good laptop that you can use and carry it with you on the road or an iPad or whatever it is, right? You can go out and get these things. I can reimburse you for that equipment. The company then takes a deduction. You do not have to report the receipt of that money anywhere. So I want to make sure that we're clear on this. The reason this is so powerful is because you are getting the money back in your pocket. The company's making money. Let's say the, money, the company makes a thousand bucks and reimburses you a bunch of expenses on an accountable plan for a thousand dollars. The company pays zero tax. You show zero of that money in your pocket on your tax return. You do not have to pay tax on that. That's why it's so important. So I touched on a few, like, hey, cell phone, internet, right? The, the home office, I can reimburse you for whatever portion of your home you're using for my benefit as the employer. So if I am the employer, I am the S corp or the C corp, rather than have a home office, like a lot of you guys, if, if, if you're used to being a sole proprietor, you know you have a special form you have to write out and they give you a safe harbor of $5 a square foot. So if you have a 10 by 15 foot room in your house, it's 150 feet, you're going to get 750 bucks a year that it can reimburse you. That's crazily dumb, right? If I actually look at the amount of space I am using, there's something called direct cost and indirect cost. Direct cost, indirect cost. Direct cost is, hey, I may have had to paint the room. I may have had to get some furniture and things like that. I can reimburse 100% of that. I may have had to get special wiring so that I have internet there. Fantastic. Company can pay for all that. Then there's indirect costs. Hey, I have a mortgage I have to pay. Hey, there's property taxes I have to pay. Hey, the house is, is a depreciable asset. It's going to be written off over, what, 27 and a half years. I should get to be reimbursed for a portion of that as that house loses value. I, you're... As an employer, I'm getting the benefit of your dollar, so I should have to pay you back a portion of it. How about uh, all the utilities? Hey, how about gas, electric? Even if I have a cleaner, I should have to reimburse. If you are meeting people in your house on behalf of the employer, you could even get landscaping. And what we do is we look at what percentage, but it's different than your typical home office. Instead of doing this weird, hey, let's just measure out the exclusive use. Let's look at the total size of the house and we're going to use that percentage. Or, hey, we're just going to do $5. You don't have to do that when you're doing a reimbursement. Now the company gets to say, hey, Toby, figure out what is a reasonable percentage of your house that we're using. And you can use any reasonable methodology. That's literally the rule from the IRS. 
So I can use the room methodology. I say how many rooms are in there that are, you know, fairly equal. Let's say that I have a three bedroom house. I may have five rooms. Okay, so one fifth, 20%. Or I take a look at the net usable square footage. I get rid of hallways and common space. And I say, what's the net usable space? Maybe the bathrooms go out the door, right? And I'm looking at what's the net usable square footage for these rooms. And then I do that and I, and I say, hey, you know what? That's it. That's 23%. I could pick whichever one's in my best interest. I could reimburse it. Guess where I report that as an individual? Company writes you a check at the end of the year quarterly, whatever it is. Well, let's just say it writes you a check at the end of the year for 7,000 bucks. Where do you report that? That's a trick question. You don't. You get to deposit that. The company writes it off as an office expense and you go about your daily, you go about your, your life. So there's another way to get money that's tax-free as well. And it's oftentimes missed. It's only available again to S Corp, C Corp's LLC taxed as S Corp, LLC taxed as C Corp and individuals. Right. So if I am a shareholder there, I can actually do this. I can reimburse the entire use of your home for up to 14 days a year. And when I say the entire use of your home, it means, hey, forget that there's a home office in there, right? That there's an administrative office for the home that you're using for the benefit of the employer that I'm reimbursing you for. I say, I want your whole house. And why do I want your whole house? Because I want to have my board of directors meetings there. I want to have sales meeting there. I want to have a day of education there. Fill in the blank. If you could do it in a hotel or in another third uh, party location, you could do it in your own house. The rule is under 288 G2, I can rent my house for up to 14 days a year, less than 15 days. So it's 14 days a year. And I don't have to report any of that income. That's how Airbnb first started marketing. They were like, hey, if you go on vacation, just rent your house out. You don't have to claim it as income. So you can pay for your vacation while you leave. I wouldn't want weird people in my house sleeping in my bed or anything like that. But that was that was actually a pretty good push there. A lot of people are like, yeah, when I leave, I'm just going to rent my house out to somebody else. And they'll be basically paying for my accommodation someplace else. And here, we're just saying, hey, if you have a reasonable business need for that, hey, you're like, hey, I'm going to do a webinar. I'm going to watch Toby and Clint do a tax and asset protection event. I'm going to have my board of directors. I'm going to have people involved with my business, which might be hint, hint, family. And we're going to sit there. And we're going to watch that for the day. I can pay whatever I would have paid a third party. So you can call another hotel. You can get room cost or whatever. You know, how much for a meeting room? How much for data? How much for a computer? Anything that you're providing to the, to the company, you're going to say, here's how much would it be for a third party to do that? My experience is around seven fifty to a thousand bucks. Uh, I've had two audits on these in twenty five years. Uh, not that they were triggered, but that where it was addressed during the audit. In both cases, one case it was in the middle of nowhere. That was about seventeen years ago. It was five hundred bucks a day, and another one was a thousand bucks a day in Florida. As long as you back it up, it's not going to be an issue. All right, so we have our home office. That's only two things: we both sell internet and uh, and home office and two eighty a. How about automobile? You can reimburse mileage. You just look at whatever the reimbursement rate is. You track your miles, get a little app called Mile IQ, and you get to say, here's business, here's personal. Do not try to buy a, 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 like a vehicle in the business unless it is being used more than 50% of the time for that business. And you know for certain you're going to do that for at least five years. So construction companies, maybe buy a truck. Otherwise, do not play that game because you have to have more than 50% business usage. And if you did buy it in the company and you tried to do some crazy write-offs, there's some restrictions for luxury vehicles and passenger vehicles, and you also have to pay tax on the personal use. The easiest route is just to get reimbursed for the miles. We don't care about the value of the car. All we care about is how many miles did you did you operate? And again, the IRS likes to put out, hey, it may be 56 cents, it may be 58.5, whatever it is for that period of time, you get to reimburse yourself. So let's say I have to do a thousand miles, you can write yourself a check for, you know, 585 uh, bucks, 585 bucks, boom. Company writes it off as a vehicle expense. You get to, where do you claim it? Again, trick question, you don't. You get to just do it. How about equipment? There's another one. So we'll go auto. How about that? I'll stick one in between the auto and the equipment. I'm going to do meals. 100% reimbursable right now. 100% deductible if you're doing it at restaurants, things like that. 
you always want to check this because it might go down to 50%. Sometimes, some years it's 100% uh, because coronavirus, there are some incentives built in. So you want to be looking at this depending on when you're watching this videos, but it's either 50 or 100%. Uh, but it can reimburse you for meals. And just because it reimburses your entire meal doesn't mean you have a taxable event to you. It just means the company may only get to write off half of it. So it could say, hey, go out and do business. Go out and meet with these people, these people, these people. I'll reimburse you for the food. You go out and entertainment's gone. By the way, you no longer can reimburse entertainment. Entertainment was taken away under the Tax Cut and Jobs Act in 2017. So it's just meals, right? So if I go down and I have a business expect expectancy, so I go out and meet with prospects or I go out and meet with some colleagues. Let's say I'm in real estate and I meet with some other agents or some other investors and I'm meeting them to talk some business and I talk some personal too, so it's okay. As long as the business was there to generate some income for me, it was part of my business, that company can reimburse you. And even if that ends up being a disallowed, hey, I can only write off 50% of it, so what? Let the company pay the tax on it. It could be less than you. Number, number five, equipment. Equipment is like your computer, your cell phone itself. It could even be equipment like, hey, I am a doctor and I need medical equipment, a dentist, I need this type of equipment. Hey, I am a, hey maybe I'm a computer guy who likes mining and I buy computer equipment. Whatever, the, you know, it's, it's just equipment. It can be under a section 179 where you get up to a million bucks you get to write off. Or right now, the easy one is 268K, which is 100% bonus depreciation. I can reimburse this stuff. Even if I buy something, finance it, I can get reimbursed for the entire amount, even if the company's going to be paying it up. So I can say, hey, bought this. Um, you know, the cleanest way is, hey, I bought it on a credit card or something. Company reimburses you the full amount. Companies using it is for their benefit. Company writes it off. You're still on the hook to pay off your the debt, but you already have the money back in your pocket. In theory, you just take that money and you, you pay it off. But I know some of you guys are just going to pocket the money and you'll pay the credit card bill over the time. All right. How about this? Health insurance. Now, health insurance, you can always deduct. It may not be on the business side. If you are a 2% or greater shareholder of an S-corp, you do not get to write it off on the business side. It goes to you as wages and you write it off on your 1040 as self-insured uh, insurance uh, payment. So if I have the insurance, health, like health insurance premium payment, I will get to write that off no matter what, whether I'm an S corp or a C corp. On the S corp, it might be on your personal, which means the company's still covering it it's paying it, but it flows down and then you write it off on your personal. That's, that's, a, that's an accounting issue. I don't write it off on the business because it's as though I'm paying you. Like the company technically does, but it's treated as income to you and then you write it off. So the, the company is getting to write it off, but we don't care. We want the money in your pocket for those things. We want the insurance to be paid and we want to make sure that you don't have to pay tax on if the company's paying it. That's what happens. If it's a C-Corp, it's even easier. C-Corp can reimburse you all medical, dental, vision expenses, period. Even if it's not a uh, premium payment. It could be, hey, I have a non-covered thing. I have a copay. I have a deductible. Let's say you have coverage. Hey, I don't even need insurance because my spouse has insurance and I'm covered. The C-Corp can still reimburse you 100% of anything that comes out of your pocket. So let's say that you have a typical plan or high deductible plan or regular plan, it's $1,000 a year deductible. Okay. And I incur $1,000. So the only thing I incurred this year is a thousand bucks. I'm never going to get to write that off personally because under schedule A, I have to exceed 7.5% of my income, but your C-Corp could say, Hey, reimburse. I'm going to have a health reimbursement plan and I'm just going to reimburse you for any of your medical expenses. So you incur a thousand bucks. It could pay you a thousand bucks. It's an expense to the company. And again, you don't have to report it anywhere on your taxes. Pretty powerful stuff, I know. And yes, it could actually cover vision, dental, health coverage, including uh, long-term care. So there's a lot of things like, again, that are covered underneath that. It's a very potent resource. If you have a C-Corp, you have a lot of benefit. That's one of the, that, that's the big difference between an S-Corp and a C-Corp as far as tax deductions are concerned, because 
the C Corp pays its own tax, has a flat tax rate. The S Corporation, everything flows down to the individual. All right. Now let's talk about some other things that we might be doing on behalf of the business. Maybe we're traveling and maybe we're doing half and half. Maybe I'm I'm going to a location. Maybe I'm going to Florida to meet with a prospect or a potential business deal, and I'm going to stay a couple extra days. As long as I am spending more than 50% or more of my time, really, it's, it's, it's the, the 51%, you know, not hard to meet, by the way, I'll tell you why. Uh, then I can reimburse the entire travel cost. So like if I'm buying airplane tickets, as long as I have a travel day there, travel day back, and however many days, and that exceeds, let's say that I have two days in Florida, I have a travel day, travel day back, I have two days there, and I spent an extra two days. This two is less than this four. I'm good, right? I, I can make sure that I am going to write that off as a business expense. Now, when I'm in Florida, the hotel days and the, the uh, eating and things like that, having meals, I have to be careful because if it's a day that I am there just staying over and goofing off, I can't deduct it. If I'm there like the two days that I am working, then yes, I can. And a work day when you are traveling is four hours and one minute. So you don't have to spend a ridiculous amount of time you know, hey, I'm going to be there for 10 hours, so I have to meet it. No, it's four hours and one minute. It's technically what it is. Or if the reason of my trip, I'm going there for a meeting, even if it's an hour meeting, I'm still going to have a business purpose. I can still reimburse 100% of the travel because I needed to go there. The IRS does not care. Even if that person, you could have met them right next door. Like, hey, I could have gotten a service that was in my town. I could have literally next door to me. They don't get to say you get to you have to use people that are closest to you. So if you have to travel to go do something, you certainly can, as long as it's an ordinary and necessary expense that is a typical or reasonable expense in your business. Boom, I can get it. All right, travel. Now let's go to the number eight, which is education. I can reimburse anything that helps me in my business. So if I go out and let's say that I want to take courses on and I'm in a real estate business and I want to learn more about flipping or wholesaling or whatever, I can reimburse that. I can pay that through the company if it's helping me in my existing business. If it's preparing me for a whole new line of business, so let's say that I'm an accountant and I decide I'm going to take some real estate courses learning how to flip, much tougher issue because it looks like you're setting up a new business. Now, Let's just say that if you are in a situation where you want to do that, then there's a way to write things off as a startup expense if that business is going to be in that particular business. So like if, if I am in the business, I want to do wholesaling, want to do these things, and I set up a company, it's going to be a management company, it could literally reimburse me for things that would be deductible to it once it sets up. I can actually go back a couple of years. So if you have education expense, that were seminars or something and your accountant said, no, you can't write that off. You may be able to go get that back if you set up a business. And I'm generally going to lean towards a C-Corp under those circumstances to allow yourself to do that. That takes us to the startup and organizational expense. They're statutory amounts, usually around five to 10,000 bucks, depending on the year, where I can just reimburse you automatically a set amount for startup expense. And a startup expense, the easiest way I explain this is if it would have been deductible had your business been in existence, it is deductible as a startup expense. I can go back and reimburse you for it. So if I'm working really hard to get my business going, I'm incurring expenses, and then one day I, I incorporate, I can go back. And there's no, the rule of thumb is a year, but there's no statute that restricts it. It's just a reasonable period of time to go back and grab the expenses that are set up to, to, to create that business. Now, there is a limit on how much I can just write as a check and write off this year. So right now, I think we're sitting around five, five grand. Sometimes that goes up, um, but it doesn't mean that I lose it. I would have to amortize it. I think we're sitting right now at 15 year amortization. So even if you have to write a check and get reimbursed for some expenses that you've incurred over the last year setting up your business, the company writes it off over a long threshold, but you can get that money back in your pocket right away. So that's always a good thing. Now, organization costs like paying an accountant, attorneys to file things, state filing fees, things like that for a business entity, you can reimburse that per 
organization up to $5,000. So if I set up a new company, I can go back and grab at least five grand. If you're paying more than that, you're paying too much. Uh, it's generally speaking for a corporation, it's going to be less than that. So you should be able to get that. All right. Number 10, we want to be able to fund retirement plans. The biggest, uh, one of the most effective and most popular retirement plans out there is a 401k where I can defer part, portions of my salary, plus I can make contributions on the employer side. There's DB plans that are called defined benefit plans where we reverse engineer them. And if you're a high income earner, you might be surprised that you might be able to put $500,000, $600,000, $700,000 a year. I've seen plans go over to the million dollar mark for people. Uh, what you're doing is you're working with an actuary to determine how much you have to have in your retirement account and when you're going to retire in order to pay you about what you're making now capped at an annual amount. Usually it's, I think it's 230 or uh, 235 or something like that right now. So if, if you are making good money, let's say that you've been making in the last few years, $250,000 a year, and you have a business, an S corp or C corp, you might want to look at that. Now the sticky wicket there is you can't discriminate against other employees. So you have to make sure that you're giving benefit to other employees. So you'd have to work with your actuary and a good company on the DB plan, but you could put a massive amount. We do have clients that put uh, quite literally close to a million dollars a year into such plans under the guidance of the DB plan administrator and their actuaries, but you can put a tremendous amount of money into those plans if you so desire. Now, the easier version is what's called a defined contribution plan where you're defining how much can I contribute. So if I'm making $15,000 a year out of my company as a wage, guess what? I can just literally pay that entire amount. It's well below the thresholds uh, that get published every year. I could literally defer my entire income right on in there. Now, wages are good other ways too. And the way to look at this is, is I'm gonna couple this with another strategy because it's technically it's number 12. But having your kids and your family in your business. So let's say that I pay a child and they do services that the fair market value is, let's say, $5,000 a year. They're not going to pay any tax on that because the uh, the exemption for personal taxes right now is, is over 12000 bucks. So I don't have to pay tax. They don't have to pay tax on that. So you, you might have some employment tax, depending on the type of business you have. You might run it through payroll or you might be paying it to another uh, LLC, depending on how much money it is or, or how they're, how old they are and what type of business they're operating. They may have their own business and you just pay their business. That's a great way to push it out. Now, going back to the actual strategy now is wages. So yes, we could pay other people, but I want to pay myself. Why would I pay myself a wage? Well, if it's an S-corp, it's because if I have profit and I have distributions, it's a requirement. I need to pay at least about a third of that profit out as a wage. Technically, it's in a reasonable amount, although the courts always seem to go with this third. But you pay yourself uh, some salary and the rest of it's going to be taxed to you, but it's not going to be subject to that dreaded self-employment tax, also known as Social Security. You literally avoid about 15.3% on the amount on the distribution. There is a phase out, but let's say you're making $100,000 a year and I was a sole proprietor, I would pay roughly $14,100 in tax because they get a partial deduction for some of that uh, Social Security tax. It ends up being the math is 14.1, even though the amount is 15.4%. So I get hit with this tax if I'm a sole proprietor. If I am an S Corp or a C Corp, I can avoid the vast majority of it. If I'm an S Corp, I just have to pay myself a portion as a salary and the rest of it is not subject to that self-employment tax or the social security tax. If I'm a C Corp, I don't even have to pay myself a salary. I can just leave all the profit in the C Corp and let it be taxed at that level, if you want. All right, last few things. So we talked about the retirement plan. We talked about wages. We talked about all this good stuff. How about the fact that if you are an S Corp, there is something called a qualified business income and there's a 20% deduction as it flows through to you. Now there's some limitations, there's some rules there, specified service companies and whatnot, and there's some income limitations. But as it sits, a ordinary company, you're going to get a 20% deduction. It is not available to the C Corp because the C Corp pays its own tax and it's already really low. Like the, the top rate of a C Corp is about is just a little over half of what we pay at our top rate. So they, they get a benefit. 
right? So there's a opposite benefit that they're going to give to the uh, S-Corp that they're going to allow there to be this qualified business income deduction. It's called a 199A deduction. 20% of the business income you get to write off, period. Again, there's some phase outs and there's some, some different types of businesses, but for the most part, that's all you have to know. If you're just a typical, regular business, you're making hundred to $200,000 a year, you really don't have to worry about that. It's going to come through. You're going to get this 20% deduction. It works. All right. The last strategy, number 12, one, two, yeah, 12, or let's see, however it is on your screen. So I'll have to do one or the other, whatever. It's 12 um, is using your kids and your family. So let's say that I have uh, family members that I help support sometimes. Maybe you're giving them money to do things. Maybe you're giving money for their kids. You might want to say, hey, why don't you sit on my board? I'll make you do some work, but I'll pay you. Uh, and if, if I pay you that money, I, I can deduct it at least that way. You're, you know, hopefully their income is lower than yours. If they have, if they're incurring expenses, maybe they can deduct it on their taxes, but it's another way for you to get some benefit. Or let's just say it's kids going to college, things like that. Then you say, you better work for me because I don't want to pay your tuition. I would rather pay you and let you pay your tuition because you have this personal exclusion on the income that comes to you. This is really great. You don't have to pay tax on it. I'd rather pay you and let you pay your tuition. And by the way, you're going to work for the company. You're going to do things. You're going to need a computer. I'm going to reimburse you for your computer. Uh, hey, you need a cell phone. I'm going to reimburse you for the cell phone and the data, all those things. If you have them entwined with your business, then your company can reimburse those and those become deductible. Otherwise, you're paying it after tax. You're paying for all those expenses. So that's another huge benefit. If you have parents that you're taking care of, under the health uh, plans we talked about earlier, they may be dependents. You might be able to cover their health expenses and things like that out of your company. Again, if it's a C-Corp, you may not have to pay any tax on that and it's deductible. So there's some other benefits, but I just gave you 12 major tax deductions and tax benefits for small business. I just wanted to give you the flavor of how these things work, just so you realize that it's not as simple as so many people say. They're always like, oh, you get to write everything off as a sole proprietor. It's not true. There's a big difference depending on how you set up your business. And you should be doing a compare and contrast. There's certain things that are deductible. If you are an S Corp or a C Corp that are not deductible as a sole proprietor, there's a reason they lose between 94 and 95% of their audits. That is via the IRS data for the last year they gave it, which was, I think it was 2020 was the last year they had table 17B where they broke that out. They're going away from it because guys like me actually look at it and start saying, hey, wait, wait, hold on. Don't do that. 70% of the people still set up as sole proprietors, even though when you compare them to like an S Corp, it's an 800% higher likelihood of getting audited. They pay much more tax and they lose all their audits. It's like, whoa, uh, let's not do that. How about that? And here's a bunch of other benefits because you're not doing that. The tax code is literally telling you what to do. If you like this type of information, please subscribe. Please share it with somebody who thinks you, that could benefit from it. And by all means, if you have comments, you have critiques, criticisms, whatever, or you have other topics you'd like us to cover, put them down in the comments below. I do read those. We do, as a group, take a look at all these things all the time. We're always trying to find out what would do the most good if we post it on our channel. We are educators first, yeah, maybe a tax lawyer, but realistically, the way I look at myself is I'm a teacher. And I help small businesses be better businesses, help their owners keep more. That's just my calling. And it's because when I started out, accountants weren't so nice and they weren't sharing that information. So I kind of look at it and go, I remember yeah, eating poo a few times after meeting with these people. They made me feel small. They made me feel stupid. And the information when I started, there wasn't an internet the way it is now. You couldn't just Google these things. Some of you guys might have the same experience. And so I just said, hey, you know what? I want to empower other people. So we do take that serious. So please let us know if there's ways that we can help or if there's topics you want us to hit. Thanks, guys.